we now have we now have our next talk, which is Amran talking about uh, digital health. Yeah. Hack, 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 hacking in healthcare. Hacking in health. So yes. So go ahead, Amran. And yeah. Um, welcome. Um, Due to some time constraints and personal circumstance, I've not been able to bear this talk for as, as much as I'd like. Also, I'm completely and utterly uh, tired, so I won't be giving the full talk. My compatriot, companion, colleague, companion. call him what you will, Mr. Yan, he will be doing the rest of the talk. But I'm gonna give you a quick five minute redux of what my talk was about, um, which essentially starts out by saying that Everything you kind of see in terms of digital services and apps and little things that you stick to your wrist, they're all a bit kind of dodgy, if not useless. Um, your body is a, is a function of hundreds of thousands of years of evolution. It works on time scales of months and years rather than days and weeks. Um, your most important thing you can do for your body uh, in terms of monitoring is actually not to monitor yourself and eat well and eat healthily. The, the, the whole five day a thing of fruit and vegetable comes from a Californian study suggesting that if you eat 400 grams of fruits and vegetables a day, you will be healthier. However, most dietary research is, is less causation and more correlation. The whole thing with wine in France and uh, a whole bunch of other stuff, it's, it's very much kind of, oh well, these people seem to be doing this and we think that's healthy. One of the things that kind of sticks if you read through research papers is the Mediterranean diet and researchers go bananas over that. There aren't too many people um, doing kind of causation studies at the moment because it's slightly dodgy. You basically have to put a human being in a room for a couple of months and feed them exact amounts of food to kind of you know, figure out uh, what effect it has on the body. Funnily enough, there's an institute in America set up recently by a philanthropist um, and they're actually starting to do this, so there should be some interesting research coming out over the next couple of years about it. But essentially, as what we know is not really what we know. Um, and if you're taking vitamin pills and, and silly diets, well, you're probably harming your body as much as you're doing good. Um, s stick to a diet that's uh, more vegetables than meat. Eat sensibly, eat variably. Some things that are good for you will also be bad for you. Some things that are bad for you will actually be good for you. Um, they've discovered things like with diabetes, certain things that you eat that are bad for you actually produce a, a response in your muscles that kind of help with insulin, uh, dealing with insulin so you're not affected by things like type 2 diabetes as much. Um, the second part is if you are going to monitor yourself, the kind of basic things you want to uh, monitor are things like blood pressure. Don't buy the little cheap ones from China that fit around your wrist, 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 wrist uh, buy kind of a decent one for about 50 quid. Um, it won't be accurate, but it'll be accurate enough. And what you want to see, what you want to look for is trends over time, over six months or a year. Um, another good thing, in fact, an essential thing I would suggest for if you want to monitor yourself, you can buy these strips in the tub, and they're urine test strips. And they turn all different kinds of shades of brown and yellow, and they tell you, indicate what kind of things that might be wrong with your body. And they generally catch a, kind of long, um, a lot of long-term disease, things like type 2 diabetes, kidney failure, uh, and a bunch of other stuff. And they're really good first indicators. If your body is in like serious trouble, you need to go to a doctor. You need to seek out that technical science. If you're fairly healthy, maybe there's something in your diet. Um, and I kind of encourage going to people who aren't quite doctors, but aren't quite nut jobs. Um, some herbalists are studied like for two years and this kind of stuff, and they're actually worth going to because they will look at your whole holistic uh, way of being and kind of try and see any patterns in that. What else? Yeah, I think that's kind of, kind of it. Don't buy into the whole kind of monitoring your heartbeat every other bloody second or buying a little EEG device. If you've got a specific complaint and your doctor's worried about you, they'll do that anyway, and, and doing, doing it more often at home can help, but usually not, not so much. Um, so thank you for that. Now I'm gonna introduce you to Jan, and he's gonna carry on the talk in a slightly different direction. Thank you, and I'm very sorry I couldn't give you the full one. Am I on? So hi, I'm Jan, I'm not Amran. Um, that's Amran, I can do this. Am I audible? Okay, good. Um, I was kind of sucked into doing this talk and I've done it before at other hacker camps 
and um, he told me he was, he was feeling not so well and asked me to, to fill in the rest of the, um, what is it, half an hour? Yeah, you got about 20 minutes left. 20 minutes, awesome. Um, and what I want to talk about is building houses. Completely different subject, so if you want to walk out, now fine. <laughs> now would be a good time. If you want to stay, awesome. Um, a couple of months back, we, um, we were discussing things um, that came out of, of a bit of, hob of a hobby of mine. I had built a CNC router, which is like a 3D printer, but it takes away material instead of adding material. So you could do wood and aluminum and all kind of, that kind of stuff. And as soon as you build one of these machines, you start looking for nails to hit with it. Because you've now got a very fancy hammer. You're very proud of this hammer. Where are the nails? What do you do with it? You know, the guys at the laser cutter tent, they build all these little machines and, and little gadgets with the laser cutter because they build, you know, a very complicated light giving hammer. And that got us thinking about what we can do with it. <laughs> yeah. We'll do on the fly slides because I didn't bring mine. It's a, it's a very nice hammer, equals CNC sign. So what happens is you, you, you're looking for things to do with this machine. Um, and normally you just pick a job and find the tools that you know, go with it. And we just had a tool and we're clueless about what to do with it. Um, that kind of led us to building, uh, no, that's not true. No. Someone showed us a, an episode of, um, what's it called? Grand Design. Grand Design. That's a BBC show, you might have seen it. They take these old weird houses or like a water tower or train shed or something and they build someone's awesome. What was the website that did it? Sorry, what? What was the website that the company did? Facet Homes. Don't mind that. So what happens is they, they, um, they built this house out of plywood and it looks amazing. And what they did, what they actually um, did differently than any other building companies, they, they bring a shipping container with the CNC machine in the shipping container to the site that I want to build at. And they just shove in these sheets of plywood, you know, the regular ones that you use for, for you, know, you get at the, the building depot. And from these sheets of plywood, they cut all, all kinds of shapes and they stick them together with, with nails and uh, this pneumatic hammer thing. And from these things, they build boxes. These boxes go on the floor and they comprise all the walls and they make uh, the ceiling out of them, and these things actually turn into a really awesome, cool house. Do you have anything online? No. Why not? I don't know which one it is. The internet's broken. <laughs> is it? Amran's broken. Amran's <laughs> broken. We knew that. Which one is it? Facet. Facet. I don't know. What, you what, what are you doing? <laughs> Sorry. I'll carry on, shall I? Yeah, you can. So um, using this construction method, um, they basically pin a bunch of metal spikes into the ground, lay down uh, wood planks, and then attach the boxes uh, onto the wood. So they'll make a floor out of these cuboidal boxes, and then the walls, and then the ceiling, and then walls, and then the, the roof. It's not really visible, is it? Uh, well, uh, let, me, let me try and fix it. You try and figure with the browser thing. So what they do is they, they design the whole the whole house in um, your regular outer cut or something, and they design every, every single one of these boxes, which is, you know, nice, awesome. They can build every shape they want. They build tree house-like things, they build mansions, they build um, this little thing. And this obviously takes them a lot of time to get from, you know, someone's plan, someone's design in their head, and then doing the whole architectural thing designing the whole house off-site in a 3D prog program. And then, um, and then once they've done all this, they go on-site, hopefully in summer, and they, they just mill or print the whole thing in two or three weeks. And if they find something that you know, they overlooked, they change the design, do another piece of plywood in the machine, and then out comes the, out comes the piece they need. Um, I'm a programmer, and I like to do you know, logical things, and I like to do things that I can reproduce. Um, He's boring. So that's why the whole, well, <laughs> that's why the whole CNC machine kind of, you know, intrigued me. I can make a computer do what I want in the physical world. And seeing that, seeing that, that episode of Grand Designs, I thought, well, what are they doing? Why are they 
deliberately trying to make, you know, add hours into this project. They're just designing this thing for months and months on end, and then the client comes in is it's yeah, it's gone winter now. I'd like thicker walls or I need more overhang on the on the ceilings. I don't know, whatever. They just keep changing the models and keep changing whatever they want because you know they're getting time to do this. Um, that kind of boiled down to why aren't we doing this in software? It's, it's not a really difficult problem. It's a problem that you know, has a lot of, has a lot of uh, <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> a lot of steps involved, but it's not difficult. There's no rocket science involved. And that, that made us think about um, what you really want to do is you, you want to have something like a browser where you can go in on your iPad or your work computer while you, while you work. Your boss doesn't know about this. You go online and you kind of just draw the outline of your house. You draw what you probably can afford and want to use as a house. You draw your living room, you draw your sleeping bedroom things and, and bathroom. And on that map, you, you take the time to actually mark down where you want to have uh, power sockets and water and windows and all that kind of stuff. You can do all that stuff in a browser nowadays. <coughs> Browsers are amazing. They, they, you know, three years from now, by the time we get to actually building a house, they'll be even better. And you just draw the building plan like you do in, in Sims or Theme Hospital. Maybe you're familiar with these games. And once you've done that, and at some point in your life, you'll actually be able to buy and afford a plot of land to build on. That's, that's the moment you want to you know, have some speed in the project. You don't want to have the piece of land sitting there for two and a half years while some architect does all these architect things. And I don't know. They might do really fancy things. I don't know. I've never talked to an architect before. But what you really want is to have the house the next month. Because you don't want to have you know, money going to your old house and money going to your new site, and that being some muddy pool where you can live. So we think it's, it's possible to actually make, um, make a building plan out of this, this floor plan and slice it up into wall segments like these. So we just kind of think, oh, that's a wall three meters wide. We need that many boxes. That's a wall that many meters wide. We need that many boxes. This is a box with, with a hole in that place, on this place for the, for the electrical sockets or the water mains or whatever. You can all do this in software. And from there on, you just get all these box designs and shove that onto the next program, which will actually render the box, or render all the stuff that needs to be cut by the CNC machine. Um, there's not really a point to this, except for the fact that if you do this in software, you can just tinker on it. You can work on it. You can build it. You can build it on scales, models. And then by the time you get by you know, to building a house, you probably you know, have running software that you can use to actually build it. Hopefully, you've been sharing this on GitHub and, or some other program or software. And people can actually help you add features to the house. So I'm guessing you, you can start out with having a shed-like structure. 90 degree angles, not too many weird windows and that kind of stuff. But if time advances and, and more people add and join and start building code for this, it shouldn't be too difficult to add what, like roofs like this, or flat roofs, or suspension, or what I don't know, cantilever things. And Yeah. yeah, what what Jan is not explicitly saying is that picture there, every line was hand drawn, and what we're saying is you can automate that and you can get a piece of, piece of software to draw it for you. Pretty much. So we think we could, this could kind of transform middle class, low income housing quite uh, exceptionally. Um, it would put the, the means of construction essentially in the hands of people rather than. Uh, architects. I mean, you still have to abide by uh, the laws and regulations, but you can build that into the software uh, to make sure things meet those standards. And the architecture, architect, sorry, um, just becomes a, a checkbox. It's like, does the architect okay the plan? Yes, go ahead, build it. 
And I think the beauty of it is you can build a house. I mean, they've already built houses like this and they've had about five people build the whole house. Um, you can also work in technology into this. So you can fill the, uh, the gaps with insulation. You can work in underground heating. Um, if you buy standard size glass panels for windows, you can also work in uh, extra insulation that way. You can also include implicit design features which are meant for human beings. Because if you buy a modern house right now, you might have like a little plug in the wall for your internet, but they don't put a power socket there. They put a power socket like in one end of the living room. It's like, what's the point? You're doing it on cost purposes and you're doing it for your own convenience. You're not doing it for the convenience of the person buying the house. So it doesn't just end with little sockets. It goes right down to things like bathroom, placement of rooms, layout of the house. It can be, it can be customized quite a lot in the beginning and produce a plan for a house which you can build with you and your friends, pretty much. Yep. Yeah, while we were thinking about what you can do as soon as you actually remove steps from your hands um, and give them to the computer, that gives you a bunch of opportunities that, you know, they're not really obvious at the front, but once you think about them, um, for example, why does everyone always rent some dude to do their kitchen or rent some dude to do the tiles in the bathroom because we don't do that very often. We do that once and then you need to live in that bathroom for 10 years so you see every tile that's slightly off. <laughs> so that's why you pay some bloke who doesn't even probably speak English like me. A whole bunch of money and they, they tile the whole room and you yay, it's all straight-ish. And if you, if you do this, if you design the house on a computer and if you actually have a computer cutter, like a router, cut out the actual wall panels in your bathroom. You could easily ask the computer to just um, mill out square pieces where the tiles should fit. Just tell the computer how big, uh, how big the tiles are, what kind of configuration you like. You can do this in software, you can work on this for weeks, because that's what, we, what we're good at. You can do this uh, on the couch. Bring the code, make the code, share the code, whatever. and then. By the time you actually get to building a bathroom, you just buy the tiles. And then the computer will make all these nice little, nice little yeah, boxes where you can put your tiles in. It'll be straight. Same goes for underfloor heating. You can just ask the computer to just make these little, well, what's it called? Uh, uh, things that you put things in. <laughs> just little ditches in your ground so you can lay the, the underfloor heating in. Question? Hang on. Yeah. Testing. Yeah. Do you think the future will be going this way, or will it be using 3D printers to print the houses? So the thing with 3D printers is what they don't tell you is they're like really, really, really precision machines. They're like 0.01 precision. And to have that kind of precision, the, the level that the machine sits on needs to be perfectly level and perfectly flat in all planes, in all directions, right? And it needs to be dust free because if you have a bit of dust and it's printing a house in 3D, wherever the bit of dust is, it slightly raises the gantry. So you have this little notch all the way up the side of your house. But not only that, you've got to level out all the ground around where you want to build to be perfectly flat. And it's like, that's completely useless. You're going to spend like tens of thousands of euros or pounds or whatever currency you use here um, to completely level out a bit of area so you can 3D print it. And for that money, we reckon we can build a two bedroom house for this in about 30,000 euros, which is not silly money, it's not insane money, young people can afford it. That's how much it would cost just to level out the ground just to build 3D printing for three houses. They don't work in disaster areas because you can't even build, you can't even build a cardboard house in disaster areas without like trouble. How are you going to get a machine that requires tolerance of like 0.1 millimeters? In? There is a chap, I, I'm just reading this last week or so, um, chap I think in this country that has built a, what well, used a, a, a converted 3D printer, well, I guess he built it himself, to do a castle-like summer house in his back garden. And, mm -hmm. I mean, it's not a castle, it's a summer house, but it looks like a castle. Um, and I think the only real problem that he mentioned was having to mix up the cement himself to get that accurate. Um, yep. I've never tried 3D printing myself, so... Well, designing these, these machines that go X, Y, and Z, it's all the three axes, means that the machine needs to be absolutely 100% rigid. 
And the bigger that machine gets, the bigger the problems get with just general engineering. Building a bigger CNC is a, lot, is, a, is a pretty big problem. But the CNC only needs to be as big as the biggest box, which is you know, 100 times smaller than the actual size of your house. And the machine can be in an enclosed area. It can be in a, in a shipping container, whereas your 3D printer needs to be out in the wind and the rain and all that kind of stuff. And even then, if you're going to pump up all the concrete to the second floor, that means you have this huge load of weight shifting all the way up, and your machine needs to be capable of actually holding all that weight up and not bending and not you know, twisting. Because like you said, it'd be weird if your top half of the building is just slightly off. <laughs> Doesn't look, doesn't look right. So if, if, if I'm understanding correctly, you're saying that you can use this technique to build affordable homes. Yep. Um, so for a complete home, how much do you think that would cost in euros? I know the, the, the facet guys. There's a construction company in the UK that actually does this. And they spend, I think, half of the money on you know, drawing the cat things and, and, and doing all the, all the work in advance that the software could do. Um, they make amazing buildings because they, they spend all this time on it. But so, so if you build a building with this technique, what sort of budget could you build a complete house for? I, I, we, we did the costing on the plywood and some of the other costs, and we think it's around 30,000 euros for a very small two-bedroom house. So 30,000 pounds for a complete yeah. house? Yeah. yeah. So when's that going to be in Kickstarter? Okay. No, so this, this project is also taking the viewpoint of like the open philosophy, so our designs will be open, our documentation will be open. We kind of expect people to take it. The problem is you need a lot of um, expertise to get involved with the project to do it, and that's a barrier to entry, sure, but it's not a barrier entry to use it. So maybe small companies pop up that use it and kind of start spreading it around. We're doing it as a, as a, a thing of passion. It's a project, private project for us. We're not looking for funding. We're not necessarily, no, we're just, uh, not necessarily I'm looking. I'm going to do this anyway. Yeah. Um, it's going to take me some, some years to actually make a house out of it, but that's fine. Um, but to give you an example, a piece of wood like a bit bigger than this black one I'm standing on. I'm not sure if you can actually see it. There's a corner here and there's a corner beneath the beam here. That will set you back about seven euros if you buy enough of them. And enough is what you need for a house anyway. So the economy of scale compared to you know building something out of wood and then building a house out of wood is tremendous. And like I said, 30,000 euros for a small house um, should be doable, and I don't know. This, the, I know the, the the English guys do some some steel framing if they if they need to go across the, the the living room and it's more than six meters wide, but even those things are not that expensive. So yeah. Any other questions? Oh, we've got one on the back here. Actually, for time, I think. Probably got to wrap up after this. Yeah. Um, just uh, uh, in terms of the, the cost to the, to the company who starts doing this, would that just be the CNC machine? Is it all quite standard, or would it require some specialist large scale CNC machine? No, I mean, you, you can use the CNC that fits inside a container, and that's what the guys who did this uh, originally did. So, um, the CNC machines that they use are standard, run of the mill, not very special, not very accurate. Um, machines they buy, I think about, they, they spend about 30,000 euros on the container and the CNC machine and all the other crap that they, you know, think they need. Um, and that's something you can just sell off at the end or maybe borrow or rent or whatever. So that's, that's an investment you need to make, uh, which is obviously the same for a small and a big building. But if you want to make more buildings, that's fine with the same CNC machine. And I think you can build one yourself if you're, you know, if you're into that kind of things. You can build a big enough CNC machine for about five thousand pounds. One, one last question. About how long do you think the houses will last? Made from plywood, doesn't sound the sturdiest and long, most long-lasting material. That's, so, yeah, that's you can, I... well, you can build these things in the rain, um, and then what you tend to do is you tend to render them externally. So it makes them uh, uh, more weatherproof. Um, but what, would you, what do you end up with? Like lime or something like that? Oh, pick a material. It's up to you. So the, uh, the English company, they're actually using um, standard you know, rendering for the outside. Same thing you'd put on a, on, a, on a brick building or something. 
uh, to, just to seal it. Uh, they've also done houses where they just um, put sheets of metal on, and it looks nice because it, it, it will give this rusty feel on the outside. As soon as, as soon as the rain just kind of hits this barrier and there's a bit of dry air behind it, it's, it's fine. And they, um, they've, the, the videos, they've done all this work for us, and they, uh, they patented the whole thing, but it doesn't matter. It's source code. What are you going to do? And what they did is they, they asked uh, insurance companies to see if it's safe, and they say, well, insurance costs are the same for a regular building. Um, life expectancy is at least 30 years, which is, well, it's not as much as a brick and mortar building may be, but in the end, if something starts rotting, you just take out the box and put a new one in. If that's, you know, if worse comes to worse, you could always do that. All right. Um, I think that's it. Yeah. yeah. So if anyone has any questions, so yeah, thank you very much. We had two two talks at the price of one. There, we had uh, hacking healthcare and uh, Amran's insight into how to take care of yourself, and uh, all about new new forms of construction. Yes. And uh, I don't know why you're not putting on Kickstarter. You, you get some money on that. Who would say no to a house of We want course. to keep control, and we want to keep control of how we would do it. If we had to do it on Kickstarter and raise funding, we give away control, and if, if essentially it might end up that the project isn't free anymore. And what's the point of doing this if a company holds it? It will just die. Okay, I'll build a house. <laughs> That's okay. okay. Thank, Thank you. you very much.